Kentucky. Faith is the touching of a mystery, writes Russian Orthodox priest Alexander Schman. It is to perceive another dimension to absolutely everything in the world. In faith, the mysterious meaning of life comes through. Faith sees, knows, senses the presence of God in the world. The Russian Orthodox priest says faith is how we sense God's presence in the world. But we don't have to go it alone. It's God's nature to communicate with us. And God can and will use anything in all creation to do this. This summer at Parkview, we've been noticing the way that God communicates us with us in our everyday lives. In a series called The Spirituality of Dot, 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 we've sensed God's life-giving presence in our friendships, in gardening, in living with gusto, even in movies. And today, we're looking at finding God's presence in birds. Throughout the Bible, God speaks and sends messengers in many forms. There are passages of scripture that show God using animals and birds to bring messages of reassurance, warning, and other vital information. St. Francis of Assisi, a famous 13th century Catholic monk, held animals and birds in such high regard that he addressed them as his brothers and sisters. The role of pets as friends and healers is widely accepted. Medical research documents that pets can help reduce stress and lower our blood pressure. Cats, dogs, and birds can make a difference in the lives of children with emotional challenges. With withdrawn patients and who have mental health issues with lonely nursing home residents and isolated prisoners. Think the Birdman of Alcatraz. Some families keep birds as pets, though mine never did, probably because we always had cats in the house. <laughs> but we always had a bird feeder outside our kitchen window. My dad loved to watch the birds, and he's the one who always kept the feeder filled. I think that for my dad, watching birds at the feeder when he came home for lunch after a long morning of surgery, gave him a chance to catch his breath, to reset before going back to the office to see patients. Lots of us enjoy looking out the window or in the yard or going for walks to search out favorite birds. When I moved to California from Virginia, Dwight stuck a bird feeder on a post and put it in a planter on my condo patio so I could watch the birds while I'm sitting on the couch eating breakfast. I refill the feeder every morning and I crumble unsalted saltines on the fence board for the crows and jays. Those bushy-tailed birds like to eat crackers too. Birds brighten and enrich our lives in all kinds of ways. Lisa mentioned the New York Times article on birding. And that I got to read that article she mentioned that was entitled, Birds Are My Eyesight. It was written by Susan Glass, a poet and English professor in Saratoga, California, who navigates areas with an avian soundscape. An avid birder, she remembers a place not by how it looks because she can't see it, but by the birds she hears around it. Remember when we used to call it bird watching? Nowadays, we call it birding because people of all abilities enjoy identifying birds. The Massachusetts Audubon has created a series of all persons trails designed for accessibility for everyone. The Cornell Lab Merlin Bird ID app makes it easy for novice birders like me to get in on the fun. So yesterday, I went outside and held up my phone 
and recorded the birds that the app identified around my house. They were house sparrows and barn swallows. It's fun to get to know the feathered friends in my neighborhood. Those in World War I and II were familiar with the pigeon post. Selectively bred to find their way home over extremely long distances, carrier pigeons took wartime messages written on thin paper rolled into a small tube and attached to the bird's leg. A pharmacist in Germany even used carrier pigeons to deliver urgent medication. Think of how often birds show up in literature. The albatross in the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Edgar Allan Poe's raven. Keats' ode to a nightingale. Harry Potter's white owl. And also in the Bible. Few symbols bring as much spiritual comfort as the dove. Pure and gentle, faithful, the fitting symbol of the Holy Spirit that descended from the open heavens upon Jesus at his baptism. As Carla read, a bird is featured in another story in the Bible, maybe the most familiar of all to both young and old. It's the story of Noah and the ark. When it finally stopped raining, Noah sent birds to check on the flood conditions. Reading the story in Genesis again last week, I was surprised to notice there were two birds in the story. First, Noah sent out a raven to check on surrounding conditions. Maybe that raven headed off to the Tower of London and stayed there, because it's the dove who becomes the hero of this story. We can imagine the timid messenger sent forth by Noah's hand from the open window of the ark. It flew over the vast surface of the waters, searching for a place to rest, but couldn't even find a place to perch. Water still covered the earth. After her quest was over and the weary wings brought back only a message of defeated hopes, the dove returned to the only safe refuge and Noah gently put forth his hand and drew her to him. After seven more days, Noah sent the dove out again in the hope that the flood waters might be receding. The dove disappeared from view, searching for any sign of safety and rest. In the evening, as Noah watched and waited at the open window of the ark, he saw afar off the glint of snowy wings against the golden sunset. And the dove returned with a freshly picked olive leaf in her beak. Here's the way Frederick Beekner describes that moment. The dove stands there with her delicate scarlet feet on the calluses of Noah's upturned palm. His cheek just touches her breast so that he can feel the tiny panic of her heart. His eyes are closed, the lashes watery wet. What he weeps with now is no longer anguish, but wild and irrepressible hope. That is not the end of the story in Genesis, but maybe that is the end of it for most of us. Just a little sprig of hope held up against the end of the world. No one knew the flood was about to be finished. He waited another seven days and sent the, bird, the dove out a third time. This time she didn't come back. And to this day, the dove and the olive branch have become symbols of peace and rest and hope. Poet Emily Dickinson says it this way, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. God used birds again during a drought in ancient Israel, ravens this time, as messengers of hope and meals on wings for the prophet Elijah. They brought him bread and meat twice a day for breakfast and dinner not just to make sure that he got his daily supply of vitamins, minerals, and protein, 
but because there was work for him to do. There were Baal prophets to confront and, spoiler alert, to do away with on Mount Carmel. There were kings to anoint and a new prophet to appoint to wear his cape and continue his legacy. God used the ravens to remind Elijah of God's constant care for him. Trusting God to provide for his daily needs was part of Elijah's work. Trusting God in the midst of real life concerns is what Jesus was talking about when he pointed to the birds of the air in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Look around at the birds of the sky. They don't sow. They don't harvest. They don't even put things aside for safekeeping. Still, your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth a whole lot more than they? Jesus constantly directs our attention to Creator God and encourages trust in us by asking, if God takes care of birds, won't God take care of you? Won't you take care of each other? The Matthew passage shows us God's care for birds. But sometimes we don't do a very good job of caring for them. We put spikes on roofs, pickets on fences, scarecrows in gardens. All of these say, birds, you're not welcome here. All of these cut birds off from what God has provided for them, a place to perch and feed and sing. We say, fly away, birds, fly on south, go somewhere else, sing, but don't stay. Be beautiful, delight our eyes, then go away. I wonder what God thinks of all of this. Humans crowd birds out, but thankfully not everyone disregards what birds need. There's a wonderful new series on Hulu called Extraordinary Birder. Has anybody seen it? I just found it last week. It stars Christian Cooper, an avid bird lover. His name might ring a bell. He was in the news a while back. Cooper was birding in Central Park's Ramble early one morning, and he asked a woman to leash her dog. She took offense and called police and falsely accused him of harming her. Long story short, the woman lost her job when they found out she filed a false report. And Christian Cooper landed a cool job traveling the world, reporting on birds for National Geographic. And that's what Extraordinary Birder Show is. Cooper's dad gave him his first set of birding binoculars when he was 10, and he's been a birder ever since. His delight in birds is absolutely contagious. One of the best things about that show, Extraordinary Birder, is watching Cooper meet with biologists and wildlife advocates who are making the world a more welcoming place for birds. For instance, skyscrapers in New York City now have to use a special kind of bird glass with a little pattern that birds can see because birds can't see regular glass and they crash into it. Bird fatalities from glass crashes are down 90% in New York City. That's progress. This care for creation, care for God's creatures, is important to us because it's important to God. It's the mandate that God gave in the garden to care for all things. It's up to us in the church to go out into the world and spread the good news that care, not fear, is what God intends. Welcome, not weapons. The world is a gift from God to all of us. And it's not ours alone to own, but ours to share. So that everyone has food to eat and a safe place to land and a song to sing. As we care for creation, we discover God's grace and joy. Joanna Macy, a Buddhist, observes, grace happens when we act with others on behalf of our world. 
An attitude of caring is a natural outgrowth of grace and our continual partaking of the divine. We come to realize that daily life is a theater of grace with continuous performances. The sacred is here and there and everywhere. Sufi poet Rumi writes, something opens our wings. Something makes boredom and hurt disappear. Someone fills the cup in front of us. We taste only sacredness. This is a message of hope that we bring to the world as we build our arcs with love and ride out the storm with courage and know that that little sprig of green in the dove's mouth speaks of a reality beyond the storm, more precious than we can even imagine. Amen.